tell them you didn't expect yeah, that, huh? He just threw me on screen. Oh, I just threw you up there. I, you, a little bit of a surprise, man. So, what do you got for us today? I know this is your first of two appearances. Later on, we're going to be doing a prompt injection competition with you, and you told me to get ready, to get my prompt injections ready. So, I've been, uh, you know, studying a little Reddit. But in the meantime, you got a presentation, man. I'm going to kick it off to you because you only got 10 minutes. Let's do it. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, baby. All right, I'm going to be talking a bit about some of the emerging patterns we've seen with uh, LLMs in production. Uh, but first, a bit about me. Um, so my name is Willem. Uh, my background is in production ML, built a bunch of production ML systems um, at a company called Gojek. Uh, really also doubled down and focused on ML tools and frameworks and platforms. Um, so one of which was a Feast open source project we built and open sourced and adopted by a bunch of companies like Shopify and Twitter and Robinhood and um, some others. Um, but I've already been working with teams building ML tools and platforms and um, you know, helping them do it in a reliable way. And so that's why the generative AI space is interesting to me because of the challenges we're seeing today. So what are we? What are the, some of the unique challenges that we see today with uh, generative AI? And um, you know, I, I guess like in, in general, um, uh, the, key, the key ones we're seeing are around reliability, cost, latency, and safety. And the numbers on the screen there are from um, an LLM in production survey that out. And they're basic teams that have responded and said, this is an egregious or like a, a critical problem for us. And so reliability is obviously one of them because you're dealing with like unstructured or textual output. Coercing that into something that your application can use is hard. Uh, cost is a big one. Um, if you're an AI builder today, you're either asking users to provide an API token or you're absorbing a lot of the cost yourself. And so this is a challenge that a lot of you know, product builders are faced with today. Uh, we've also deployed a bunch of probes globally, or I personally did that. And I've been monitoring these API endpoints myself, the, the providers, and they're really, really slow. So they're like 400, 500, 600 milliseconds. Um, sometimes they, they even spike to like 18, 20 milliseconds for a completion. So how do you build a product around that? And especially if you have to do many round trips, it's very challenging. Um, and finally, safety is hard. Um, you know, folks are inputting private data, or they're um, you know you're vulnerable to private, um, sorry, prompt injection attacks, and all kinds of vulnerabilities that are kind of new and unique. Um, so it's it's challenging building on LLMs today, and you know that's kind of like opportunity for us to um, batten uh, things down a little bit. So how do you use LMs effectively? The same rules apply to structured ML, really, um, in the space. Start simple. Um, start with basic prompting. Start with including some examples to do some few-shot prompting. Start introducing external data or exogenous data sources using Langchain, Llama Index, and composing workflows. Um, so you incrementally increase your accuracy over time. Yes, you'll increase your costs and latencies a little bit, um, but often that's OK if you're um, you know, accuracy and uh, reliability improves. Um, but if but soon you get into a point where you want to get to iterative refinement, where you do things like prompting, uh, where you're doing tool selection, calling out to APIs like Wolfram Alpha or others to give you some more reliable um, responses. Um, and I think most folks end at this stage. But you know, if you want to take things further, you can also um, start using um, you know, fine-tuning hosted models or using open source models and training them from scratch. But that's uh, something that we wouldn't discuss today. But um, you know, in terms of the techniques that we're seeing out there in the wild, I think one of the key ones that you know, Shri and some of the others have been introducing and um, kind of spearheading is ad adding structure to your res um, responses. So you can ask a model to provide a or respond in a TypeScript schema format, and it'll do so. And you can encourage it to be more reliable by giving examples, asking it to take on a persona, um, and just bursting it or reminding it, hey, always return JSON. You can even, and unfortunately, threaten the model <laughs> sometimes, and it will um, often be more uh, accurate for that uh, response. And if it fails, you just re-ask, and you can keep re-asking until, you know, I guess, it affects your UX. Um, you can increase the temperature, or you can start with a, a more cost-effective model and then ramp up to from like a GPT 3.5 to a, a, a 4. And this allows you to at least validate the outputs in a structured way instead of dealing with uh, clean text um, as the output. Um, another technique that we're seeing um, applied more, even in the production setting, is self-refinement. 
And so the idea is normally you, you, you make some kind of uh, prediction, uh, you give a, a prompt and you get a completion, but you can also in the prompt say, hey, review what you've just given me and score yourself and refine that prompt. And you can even ask the model to do this multiple times. So it's literally scoring itself and improving the prompt. Um, and this has been shown to be surprisingly effective, especially for models like GPT-4. Um, so you can say, oh, you've written a tweet for me. Make this tweet more engaging. Rate, your, rate the tweet and, and, and you know, improve it. Um, and so that's been a surprisingly um, effective technique. And it's outperformed baselines in a lot of use cases. Um, and so another technique that we are seeing out there in the wild is contextual compression. And so what you see and what you do in a lot of cases is you're calling external data sources. Maybe let's say you're using Langchain or Llama Index, and you're enriching the data in your context window with um, fresh data that's relevant to answering a question or doing some kind of task. But often it's very unstructured the way people do that today. One of the ways you can improve the density of information is by doing compression. So you can do, you can say, so let's say your question is, you scored the first goal in the FIFA World Cup. You can ex call a, a bunch of external sources and then compress based on the question that you're asking that information, even drop some of those examples and then only shove in the you know relevant ones into the context window. And so this gives you often 2x or 3x the amount of information that you can put into the context window. And that really improves the quality of the output uh, completion. So now you've got more and more accuracy and a little bit more structure, but what about latency? So one of the techniques that we're seeing now also being adopted is semantic caching. So the idea is with normal caches, if a prompt, if you're just caching prompts and there are completions, you often don't have a very high ca a cache hit rate because one character difference and suddenly the cache is going to get missed. But you can use a vector DB to also do cache hit hits. So you cache it based on a distance, uh, like a similarity distance. Um, the problem is that often, or in a lot of cases, you don't really have a hit, right? If it's if the prompts are sometimes slightly off, maybe the hit isn't a true hit. So you need some kind of evaluation function. So what folks are doing is they're using an LLM again, <laughs> using LLM for everything, but use an LLM to evaluate the output response and have a judge whether it was really a cache hit. And that, that works really well in the case where the completion that you're returning is an expensive completion. So in many cases, you're calling an LLM you know, three, four, five, six times, especially if you're using chain of thought reasoning or any kind of decomposition. So it's expensive to compute those completions. And so um, even if you have to call an LLM to validate a cache hit, it's still cheaper than having to recompute everything. This technique also works really well for tool selection where you have a set of options. So if you're using like tool like an API that you're going to uh, use or like Wolfram Alpha or something, um, th then if you have a high confidence in a single tool and no confidence in any other tools, you don't even need to call an LLM. You can just use a distance metric to evaluate the cache hit. So this is a very good technique to reduce latencies um, over time above and beyond just a normal cache. And then finally, I think one of the uh, interesting things that I've uh, realized from the paper in um, you know Sparks at AGI is that uh, LLMs like GPT-4 are extremely good at PI and prompt in injection detection. 3.5 is also is also good, but these LLMs are effective at identifying um, leakage of information, outperforming even the baseline purposeful tools at this task, um, and also prompt injections. And in fact, a little bit later today, we're going to be playing one of those games where we can you can actually try this out. Um, but so yeah, if you're building on LLMs today and you're trying to uh, make your system more reliable, faster, um, and improve the UX, um, reach out. Dude, thank you very much, Mr. Willem. This is not the last that we're going to see of you today, I know. So we're going to play that prompt injection competition. We got some uh, headphones to give away a little later and we're going to be doing it, man. Thank you so much for this talk. <laughs>